What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie, where we believe in experience becomes truth. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and joining me now in studio, your other host, Eddie Connor. Thank you, Tony, and hi, everyone. So guess where Tony and I are going next week? Where? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to Joshua Tree, California, for the Contact in the Desert Conference, which is literally the Woodstock of all UFO conventions in the country. It starts Friday, June 3rd, and it ends on June 6th. And I'm excited to attend the seminars, and we're going to be interviewing some of the top UFO experts in the world. And here to share more about the phenomenal event is the producer of Contact in the Desert, who? Paul, Paul Andrews. Andrews. Paul's sharing the history of Contact in the Desert, how it was started, and whose original idea it was. He'll also be telling us who some of the speakers are in their itinerary. So if you want more information or want to attend, Tony and I would love to see you there. Simply go to contactinthedesert.com. And on that note, please welcome event organizer and the producer of Contact in the Desert, Mr. Paul Andrews. How you doing, Paul? I'm good, you guys. I'm good. Glad to be here with you. Well, you know, we're bringing all these people that just clap for you out to the contact in the desert. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, no, listen, I love to have an audience, and they sounded very enthusiastic, and that's warming my heart. Well, good. Well, I'm excited. I've never been to, to the contact in the desert. This is very exciting for me. I know Eddie's excited about doing this. And uh, mm -hmm. but before we talk about that, uh, we want to know how are you? are you a... Uh, enthusiast also of the UFO field? I am. I, I would say that uh, the UFO field and the ancient alien field, oh, because yes. I, I feel that they're, in, in a sense, one and the same. So tell us about your background. Did you, did you ever, uh, uh, one of the experiences, like, because Eddie, as, when he was in North Carolina, saw a UFO. I was in Kansas mm -hmm. as a child, saw a UFO with my family. Were you one of the, the lucky ones? Uh, I was one of those, oh. and it started for me when I was three, four, five years old. Oh, please and tell us! My, <laughs> you know, my sister, who was uh, two years older than me, had been having fairly regular contact with, um, I should, I guess, I could say, entities that were not not of this earth. And uh, I remember one night when uh, I was very young, I, I couldn't have been any more than four years old, I went into her room, which was next to my room, and there were some kind of luminous beings of light in there, um, uh, obviously not human, but, you know, c communicating with her in a nonverbal way. And at the time, I just thought this was kind of remarkable. I thought it was part of a fairy tale or an extension of, you know, the Walt Disney, which we had begun to watch at that point. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, hovering, um, and I don't usually talk about this, you know, oh, most well, people don't ask sure. me this, but hovering outside of our window was a luminous ball of light, and uh, that was all it looked like to me at the time. And so we would... You know, we spent a little bit of time with these beings. They were mainly interested in my sister, and then they left, and I went back to bed. And this happened, actually, several times. And so as I grew up, you know, I my sister tried to explain this to my parents, and and uh, I don't think that my mother took it seriously, right. but uh, it was obvious to me that my father did. And, you know, when I asked my father about it when I was older, uh, much older, he told me that he firmly believed in the reality of extraterrestrials, of UFO sightings and abductions and all the rest of it. And uh, I, I never asked him why, but I have a feeling it was because 
he had had an experience in his life as well. Wow. What was odd to me, what was odd to me, is that he had a library full of books that were science fiction, UFO related. I'm, I mean, I'm talking hundreds of them. And I have to surmise as, as I'm older now that this was because he had some sort of experience. And in talking to my aunt, who was my, my father's sister, she indicated to me that he had confided that in her. And so I, I've come to believe that this phenomenon, this visitation, if you will, phenomenon is runs along family lines. In other words, it, it you know, I, I think it, you know, might go great grandfather, grandfather, father, son, and that sort of thing. And I can, I would only be speculating as to the reasons for this, but um, that's that's my that's my experience uh, thus far. Since then, um, I've seen anomalous lights, but I haven't had an encounter. I haven't seen a UFO since since I was a, a small child. Now I'm going to say I haven't seen one that I can remember. Hmm. Just out of curiosity, how many beings, as it were, uh, were in the room with you and your sister when you were a little boy and walked into the room, Paul? Two. And Two. Th- at first, did you think your sister was asleep? Or did you think maybe you were even asleep just for a moment? Well, I, I, I wasn't sure. I was very confused. Uh, she told me that they were the Sandman, huh. okay? And and at the time, you know, being that young and seeing that she had no fear around it, I just kind of accepted that as, as what it was, you know? Mm-hmm. The Sandman, of course, coming out of some fairy tale or children's book or other. Wow. And were they tall, short, mostly light, holographic? Did they have any physicality to them in in your memory? In my memory, they were luminous and not as dense as we are. Um, they looked sort of like us. Uh, they weren't the typical gray-looking aliens. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, when they left, they left through the wall. I mean, they didn't, you know, like climb through a window or anything like that. They just moved through the wall and left. That's why I'm asking the question. The reason I'm asking the question is because a lot of people, when you're talking about UFOs and or extraterrestrials or those actual direct contacts, they Mm -hmm. have in their mind that, well, how did they get through the window? How did they get into the property or whatever? But that's what I I see regularly. They just, they're multidimensional and they Mm -hmm. just, they traverse Mm -hmm. through the walls and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I I think that that uh, they they have a body structure that vibrates at a different rate than ours, right. and because it's less dense, they can move through things that we can't. Uh, and maybe they, I I don't know. <laughs> I'm just I'm just <laughs> speculating. <laughs> that's a very very small part of the story. I mean, that's my experience. I'm sharing it. Um, well, we appreciate I, I, it. I, I really don't. I can't really add much more than that. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I know this though sparked because, like, when I was a child and we saw a UFO, I think I was probably about seven or eight in Kansas. But it does spark mm-hmm. an interest that does never go out. And so, when I know, growing up, what did was there a point that you kind of like kind of forgot about it, or is it something that always was stuck in your mind and then eventually became more of a not an obsession, but something that you just had to know more about what you saw. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's very well put. Uh, I put it out of my mind uh, really until I was much older. Um, I would say in my teens, and then I, you know, I began to have memories of it, and you know, it was kind of disconcerting to me. So I tried to push them down. Um, you know, it wasn't a particularly happy thought. It was kind of scary to me as I got older. Mm-hmm. Um, when I came to California, uh, and I came to California back in 1976, uh, I noticed that there was an awful lot of conversation around these sorts of topics in mm-hmm. California circles that I was exposed to at the time. And so my interest in it began to be renewed, and I began to study more and read more and go to different conferences uh, and and listen to people who had been researching this subject, I suppose, for a long, long time. And 
And so it, it renewed my interest in it. It renewed my interest in it. And, you know, my partner, Victoria, has had similar uh, experiences. And, and so when we talked about this and we talked about our experiences, we thought, well, you know, why not put, a, put together a conference that has the very best people, the people who are intellectually integrous and who are authors and who are responsible people, who can speak to the subject in a in a way that is credible and in a way that people can easily understand what they're talking about, what their experiences are. And even though a lot of the people that are are lecturing at our event are decidedly left brain and on the scientific side, they're all, in our opinion, credible. And they've done their research, they've done their homework. And uh, they're trying to present a balanced and credible uh, picture of this rather incredible phenomenon that, in my mind, remind, remains the, the last of the really great American mysteries. Wow, I want to go back to your dad for just a second, because I find that there's an enormous amount of truth in most science fiction books. And sometimes there's an enormous amount of truth there that most people don't feel like they could write nonfiction books about. And so mm -hmm. it would be, wouldn't you, I, I know, I'm sure you would love to know what your dad's experience was. And I'm just curious, was he in the military by chance? He was. And I wonder if that was where it got ignited for him. Just curious. Or if it happened when he was a little boy. I, I just don't know. He was in the Air Force. He, he was an officer in the Air Force. And uh, I have pictures of him. And, you know, it may be that when he was, he was in the Air Force and they were up in the air, they saw something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. He, he, <laughs> he was kind of, um, you know, a very taciturn fellow. He didn't, he didn't talk a lot. He was, um, he was an engineer and an executive by profession. And, uh, but I know that he did do a stint in the military because I had the pictures of it. Wow. wow. That's, that's, pretty, fa yeah, that's fascinating. Love, that's very fascinating. But I, I just think maybe there's something in the fiction, the science fiction, that he's picking pieces of it out and putting it together like a puzzle. I don't think there's any question of that. And at the time, I thought it was odd that he had so many of these <laughs> books. Yeah. I mean, that was literally all he read. You know, he didn't, you know, wasn't interested in current literature or anything like that. He belonged to all the science fiction book clubs and they came into the house in packages with a regularity that would daunt the Postal Service. And and it was interesting to me, you know, at the time, but, but it wasn't really a, a, an interest that I chose to read about, read about when I was younger. I, I Obviously, as I got older, I became more and more interested in it. But, yeah, I mean, again, I think that this phenomenon is generational. That's been my experience in talking with people who have had these kind of encounters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, there's a fellow who did a lot of really good research in this area, and, and that was Dr. John Mack. Mm -hmm. Are you guys familiar with him? I'm I know not, the name. I'm not. John Mack? Dr. John Mack. He was a Harvard professor, and he wrote a book um, called uh, Abduction. And uh, yeah. the book was about selected cases that he had chosen and he interviewed the people exhaustively and I remember he brought one of them to LA and myself and this other guy by the name of Gary Schultz had the opportunity to meet him and interview this one particular woman who was just an average woman who had had an abduction experience and she was very patient with us she sat with us for about an hour and went through all the details of, of her experience. But what was impressive to us at the time was her candor and her openness and her willingness to share, which had nothing to do with selling a book or being on television or going on the radio. You know, she was just a woman who had had a remarkable experience. She wanted to share it in case anybody else out there had had it. Mm -hmm. and. And it was a gift, really, that this Dr. John Mack had, had brought her uh, to L.A. And, and allowed us to, you know, interview her at the time. And this was for a magazine that I wrote for at the time. And and I was very impressed with 
with the woman, and I was very impressed with Dr. Mack. Now, Dr. Mack, John Mack, later was persecuted by the faculty of Harvard University. They were upset that he was researching and writing about this phenomenon. And they, the cabal of them got together and tried to have him removed from Harvard. Wow. Now, Daniel Sheehan, who is an attorney who became extremely well-known during the Iran-Contra affair, uh, who is also a Harvard graduate and um, deeply religious Catholic fellow, came to his defense. And he mustered all the... Um, forces that he would for a a normal trial, and when Dr. Mack came in front of the the board that they had put together there at Harvard, he defended him vigorously and in a way that was so compelling that they eventually dropped this whole action against him. (sighs) But again, he did write this wonderful book, and I recommend it to everybody. It's called Abduction, and John E. Mack, M.D., is the author. He's a Okay. Harvard professor. Now he's died. He he died uh, just recently. Mm, but right. Daniel Sheehan, the lawyer who defended him, is one of our speakers at Contact in the Desert. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, are you a speaker? Because man, you are uh, no, I mean, right. You are, you have that ability to really catch, hook it, hook, yeah. it, hook everybody in. Yeah. Mm, mm. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I. <laughs> I am one of the people who's moderating the uh, George Nori, who's a radio personality. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He does a yes. show called Coast to Coast, and it's syndicated nationally. Right. And it's his birthday party, and so I'm going to be one of the people moderating that birthday party. My partner, Victoria, is a speaker, and she's on a couple of the panels, and she'll be there. She's, she's going to share her own experiences. And, um, you know, I... It, you know, I could. I, it would be easy for me to be a speaker, but here's the here's the reality. The reality is that there's no organizers out there. There's nobody really organizing all this information and presenting credible, large live events. Mm-mm. And so I feel that that's a way that I can make a difference. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm doing. Well, that's good that you recognize that. But uh, and uh, you know, you're letting a lot of people that are well deserved to shine. And uh, well, let's talk about because I know you know back in the seventies, eighties, and even nineties, e- even talking about UFOs, sometimes people always looked at you crazy. But you know, ancient aliens and and Hangar One and so many other television shows that are on History Channel have really brought this to the forefront and made it normal for people to talk about this and be open about it. But when did Contact in the Desert actually start? Contact in the, this is our fourth year of Contact in the Desert. And then obviously a year before our first show, it was in the planning stage. This was the brainchild of Victoria, Victoria Jennings, my partner, mm-hmm. and myself. And we decided to choose Joshua Tree because Joshua Tree was the location of the very first UFO event ever held in North America back oh. in the early 1940s. Whoa, in the 40s, and, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was put together by a fellow by the name of George Van Tassel. And I have to believe that he was probably uh, someone who was in communication at some level or another with extraterrestrial beings. And at any rate, there was a, a large number of sightings in the Joshua Tree area. Mm-hmm. Most of the local people who've lived there all their lives will tell you that they've had multiple encounters, sightings, that sort of thing. For whatever reason, be it geomantic, be it cultural, be it it political, be it the fact that it's on the ley line, we, we don't really know. But there's a long history of sightings there in the Joshua Tree area. Um, documented going back to when the Indians were there. Hmm. And, and so Van Tassel knew this. And so he organized the very first UFO expo ever held in North America. And he chose that spot because there were so many sightings. Well, and so where we're actually doing the event is at a facility called the Joshua Tree Retreat Center. And what's interesting about that facility is that it was founded by a fellow by the name of Reverend John Dingle, also known as Dingle May. Now, he was the person 
who spent seven years in Tibet from 1898 to 1905. And he wrote a book about it called My Life in Tibet. And there was actually a movie made based on his experiences. And so yeah, he right, trained right. under under the, the Buddhist monks of that time, which was, you know, most people had never even heard of Tibet, let alone been there, right? right? So he, he, he long story, but he, he gets sick. They, the monks find him. They take him back to the lamasery. He's so enthralled with what they have to offer and, and see so many miraculous things that he decides to stay there and study with them for seven years. And following that seven years, he came back to this country and he founded a, I don't want to say a religion, but a, a church where he merged this Buddhist philosophy with, with Christian philosophy, which of course was the only religion uh, in America at that time. And the church, you know, grew huge, and they had thousands and thousands of members. And so finally he made a determination that he wanted to have a retreat center. And so he looked all over California. And finally he was guided or found through his own psychic perceptions this particular spot, which is in Joshua Tree. And it's where he founded the Joshua Tree Retreat Center. Now... He and Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect, envisioned and designed and laid out the entire facility there. There's 50 buildings on it, and it's 450 50. acres, wow. which you, you guys are going to see when you come there. Yeah. And he chose this spot because he felt that the veil between the physical and the non-physical was thinnest there. And he felt that this would be a good environment for teaching the metaphysical arts, if you will. And so he founded and built this remarkable retreat center. And there's nothing else like it in America, nothing. And like I say, all the buildings were designed and built by himself, and uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright himself and Frank Lloyd Wright's son, who eventually built some of the later buildings because there were so many of them. And so this is the setting for contact in the desert. This is the place that Victoria and I have chosen to, to hold this. Well, I, I, one thing I've been looking at a lot of the pictures, and uh, just, I mean, we're lucky that we're going to go see it, but, but it is beautiful. I mean, the desert setting and just the way it's set up, it's very, very spiritual, con spiritually connected to the earth mm -hmm. and to the, to the universe. And I, that's one thing I'm, I'm excited to go out and share it with all you guys. Um, mm -hmm. and, but when they, I remember they, they said that, uh, it's the Woodstock of UFOs. I mean, if you want to put it another way, it's a Super Bowl of, uh, ufology and because you have every major hard hitter that's in the, the UFO world. I mean, these people, some of the people that are going to be speaking will blow your mind if you guys are going to see them all in one spot. Well, all in one place. That, that's what, what I'm so, so, so surpri surprised that you got everybody there at once. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, well, I mean, you make a very good point. The, the, this is a collection of the best speakers and researchers in, in, in the, my opinion. Yeah. We're actually flying in several people from Europe. And, you know, I, I mean, my partner Victoria and I feel blessed that we've been able to put this together. I mean, we feel guided at a certain level. Um, it's taken an enormous amount of resources to be able to afford to do this. And, you know, we've been fortunate enough to um, to be able to have that. And we have some wonderful sponsors, um, Longevity being one of them, who just believed in the vision from the beginning and have helped us uh, financially and in many other ways to bring it to fruition. Well, I, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, if for our listeners and our viewers that are watching live and then later uh, for the uh, our YouTube channel and iHeartRadio, uh, yeah. let's just go through a, a few of our a few of the speakers because, uh, again, when I first looked at the itinerary, I was just blown away that you had so many people. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just read the, the top the top row here. Sure. Uh, uh, it, mm -hmm. So Graham Hancock. Mm -hmm. Talk, can you just tell us a brief, briefly about some of the speakers that uh, are going to be speaking? So Graham Hancock, could you tell us a little bit about him? 
Sure. Well, you know, Graham Hancock is an author. He's probably best known for his book, uh, The Message of the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. But he's a researcher and an archaeologist and a wonderful writer. And he, along with Robert Buval, who's another speaker, right. have co-written a number of books that demonstrate a relationship between some of the megalithic structures that we have here on Earth and, and certain star systems, which many of the ancient cultures believed that alien beings came from and came down to this planet and interacted with, with people. Now, Graham Hancock's take on this is a little bit different from all of my other speakers in that he feels that the civilizations, the ancient civilizations, are actually a lot older mm -hmm. than fo folks like Sitchin and so forth ha um, believe. He believes that some of these civilizations go back to Atlantis 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, and that a lot of what we're experiencing now is a, um, what should I say, a whisper of those ancient civilizations. Now, that not all of my speakers believe that. In fact, I would say that most of them do not. Mm -hmm. But that's what he writes about, and that's what his research has led him to believe and uh, I would say that probably Robert Vival, who's one of my other top speakers, believes that same thing. But nevertheless, they they also believe in the reality of UFOs, and they believe that that there were ancient civilizations. Those ancient civilizations were influenced by star beings, if you will, and that that technology and that knowledge has filtered down through the ages, and and is really coming back again since. You know, we went through a very dark period uh, in the dark ages. A lot right. of, I believe, it was a lot of that. I believe was lost, but it's now coming back to light again. And we have a lot of wonderful people who are speaking to that. Well, two of my two of my favorites that you're going to be having there is uh, uh, David Childress, and um, of course from you know Ancient Aliens, and then uh, mm -hmm. Giorgio. Uh, Sukalis, I'm so excited about. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they are they have done some remarkable research, the both of them. And of course, they have their show Ancient Aliens on right. the History Channel H2, <clears throat> and they're actually going into their tenth season this year. Can't That's really remarkable. And, and you know they've done they've done really good work. They've gone out there and they have. Their their main thesis, and I'm sure that you guys know this, but I'm going to say it for the for the benefit of your listeners. Their main thesis is that a lot of these megalithic structures and these these old mines that are out there in South Africa and so forth hearken to a technology that the primitive people at the time could not have hoped to have constructed on their own. And, um, you know, the idea that an agrarian society, you know, four and five thousand years ago would have suspended their life's purpose and spent their lives building the pyramids, for example, or sinking perfectly square thousand foot shafts and into the ground looking for, for gold, a mineral, which meant nothing to them at the time. Uh, essentially what they're saying is that there are structures all over the earth or remnants of those structures that could have only been conceived, engineered, and built by uh, star beings, not, not of this planet, right. and that those beings came down to earth, they were looking for certain things, they um, created us the way we are now as a hybrid between them and the primitive um, uh, humans that were inhabiting the earth at the time and uh, they were here for a long period of time and then they left and we're kind of the residual um, uh, remnants if you will of, of that experience um, that's essentially their thesis and uh, that by the way was also the thesis of uh, Zechariah Sitchin who mm -hmm. is kind of a legend in oh, yeah. the ancient aliens field in that he wrote 13 volumes uh, uh, about this very theory and uh, and you know if you want to go into that I'm happy to but but we we can work our way through the speakers well uh, two two people we've had on the sh show uh, as of late and 
Uh, and two of my favorites also is Eric Von Danigan, and mm-hmm. uh, he was on the show, and then Linda Moulton Howe. Two <clears throat> amazing... The, these two, you could sit there and not say a word. And energetic. Sit, yeah, energetic <laughs> and just sit back and just enjoy the ride. <laughs> and enjoy the ride. So, yeah, yeah tell us, t- you know, for our listeners, if you don't mind, just briefly telling, because, like, especially Eric Van Daniken, he's kind of the godfather of, <laughs> of, of, of a lot of what uh, ancient alien uh, host uh, they look up to. Well, they do. Eric Van Daniken is the godfather of this whole ancient aliens phenomenon, if you will. Giorgio Sukolo studied under him and was inspired by him, and they remain colleagues today. Eric Von Daniken, of course, wrote the landmark book, Chariots of the Gods. And basically what that was is a book that was a groundbreaking book. And granted, not every single thing in there was was exactly right or perfectly stated. The concept was groundbreaking in that it, it propounded that ancient aliens, star beings, had come down to Earth they had interacted with humans, built these remarkable structures. Um, one of the things that they were most interested in was accumulating as much gold as they possibly could. And then there was a diaspora beginning in Mesopotamia that went all over the earth. Um, these people had flying craft and hmm. they had a technology way beyond it, obviously anything that the primitive life forms and the hybrids that were later, later created had. And because their lifespan was so much longer than any human, uh, from generation to generation, they didn't appear to age. And so they seemed to be immortal. They seemed to be godlike in that they never aged. And they had remarkable technology that was magical and would probably be even magical to us, to, to, to us today. Um, you know, being able to disappear and fly around and nice. having tremendous <laughs> bolts of lightning that came out of their hands. I mean, all these things are, are, are you know, magical and remarkable. And the thing with, with um, our friend Derek Von Daniken is that he was the first to put these theories forth and forth and and he became a lightning rod for a lot of ridicule in the mm-hmm. traditional archaeology field i mean they they came at him with everything they had they ridiculed him from academia right. they ridic- ridiculed him in print they did everything they could to diminish his findings and his theories and i think a lot of the reason for this is that you know, a lot of these archaeologists had written their papers and their thesis and made their career and their academic reputation based on archaeological events that Daniken, Von Daniken later proved were were outdated. In other words, that there were so many things that preceded right. it that they had been ignoring that uh, it made them look foolish. And this is one of the reasons that they lashed out against him so hard. And not only that, but their their livelihood and the money that they received were also a factor mm-hmm. in that if their theories were no longer valid or that were being invalidated by the work that Von Daniken was doing, it made him a triple threat. And so he received a lot of ridicule and um, uh, approbation from from people in the traditional archaeological field. Well, you know, I, I can sit there and go on and on. There's so many more: David Wilcox, George Norrie, Jim Mars, there's Wally Stryber. Yes, yeah, so many, so many people that we can just keep going on and on. But I, well, I, there's I, a new, there's a new fellow that you guys may not be may not be oh, aware tell, of, if I tell. may. Yeah, please. So <clears throat> there's a there's a fellow. Uh, he's he's very bright, and he's done his research, and a lot of his information comes from the ancient Vedic texts, which come out of India some of which are tens of thousands of years old. And he has written a book called Lost Star. And what the book, he, he, pre, he presents a thesis that is emerging, if you will, in the UFO ancient aliens field. And his thesis is basically that we are actually part of a binary star system. 
as are almost every other star in the universe. Hmm. And our binary twin, if you will, is a dark star. It's a star that has flared out and gone dead, and that's why we don't see it. And our orbit around it, the dance we do around it, which is like a figure eight, is so wide that it's difficult for us to comprehend it. And because the star is dark and it doesn't glow like our sun does, it's very difficult to see. But are you fellows familiar with precession, the thesis of precession? I've only heard about it, but I'm not familiar with the actual context. Well, yeah, please inform us. So precession is the science of reading the stars and the constellations. And there's about a one-degree movement every, I don't know, thousand years or so. So if you were able to be alive for 24,500 years roughly, you see all the stars in the constellation move around us as in a circle. And it, for a long time, it was thought that the reason the procession happened was because there was a wobble in the hmm. axis of the Earth as the Earth turned around. But what, what this researcher propounds is that, in fact, we are in a an orbit, if you will, a dance with a dark star, our dark binary dwarf, and that it is the movement around this star that in fact creates precession. Mm -hmm. And precession was, and the stars, as you both know, were an obsession with a lot of the ancient cultures. A lot of what they did was was, uh, uh, planned around the movement of the stars. And what you see is you see a lot of ancient observatories, especially down in Mexico, that were built thousands of years ago. And they were built so that they could follow the movement of the stars. And so this fellow, Walter Crutton, has written this remarkable book called Lost Star. And I recommend it to all of your listeners that you, I believe you can go to Amazon and just order it. And it it lays out this entire theory and thesis, which he believes, or which, which in his experience, I should say, was something that he accumulated by the uh, Hindu uh, priest or teachers of the day, if you will, and they have pulled it out of their ancient text, their ancient Vedic text. And, and I'm giving you a really kind of thumbnail of this right. particular thesis, but Walter Cruttenden is one of our speakers, and he will be speaking at Contact. Well, I, I have to say that that's now one one on the list that Eddie and I want to have on oh, our absolutely. show. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. That's fascinating. Oh, you, you've got to have it. And, and here's the good part. Not only is there a book, but he has also done a, a video with James Earl Jones doing the narrative. Oh, wow. That's uh, amazing. Oh. And and it's a, it's a fantastic video. It's called The Great Year. Actually, I have it right here in my library. I'll reach over here and get it. Yeah, it's called The Great Year. Uh, it's by Walter Cruttenden, and it's narrated by James Earl Jones. And it's extremely well done, extremely well done. And it's based on his book, Lost Star. And it's done with a lot of research and intelligence and and just remarkably good video and graphics. And so it's this this video and that book that I, I recommend if you know, you're in the field or you want to move you know, to the next level and say, well, you know, what's next? This is kind of what's next. And most all of my speakers who are at the show, they all acknowledge Walter and they are all have been influenced by him to some greater or lesser extent. This is the first time he's ever done a show like this, ever. Hmm. And he's, for the you've laid out, there's such an impressive array of speakers there. Well, we only have about five minutes left. And I, I hear I was worried that we're not going to, you know, we, I'm like, oh, we'll probably be on about 15, 20 minutes with uh, our, our wonderful ho- our guest here, Paul yeah. Andrews. <laughs> and here, uh, like, I'm running it's out like, of time. I know, like, it's like, <laughs> well, Mind blown! <laughs> yeah. Exclamation point! And you know, because we stream not only through our website, but we also stream directly to Facebook. And people on both both our website and mm-hmm. Facebook are loving what we're talking about. Yes. One thing that we are very excited about: one of our listeners, uh, one 
a uh, all weekend pass to the Woodstock of the UFOs, Contact right. in the Desert. John Hamilton, he was one of our listeners. Uh, he <coughs> filled out the the form on our website, and he won. So we're so happy that he's going to be there. And uh, Eddie and I are so excited. Like I said, this is going to be so much fun for us. Not only just, you know, we get to meet, hopefully we get to meet Paul uh, and <coughs> hearing uh, these amazing speakers, but we get to spend time, you know, at the Joshua Tree Retreat Center, and it's going to be well, amazing. Right. You, you get the double whammy. And, yes. you know, there, there's tours also to Giant Rock, which is the actual spot where they held the very first convention. It's a mile or two down the road. And then there's we organized t- tours to the Integratron, which is a, a structure that Nikola Tesla built and designed, but never completely finished. And that's right down the road also. And that's because this is such a, a remarkable area. It's a, it's a, you'll feel it as soon as you walk on. As soon as you get there, you'll feel it because I, I can tell that you guys have been around the block in this particular area. <laughs> and may, a little. I want to I, I want to leave you guys with one parting thought, if I Please may. Please do. Yes. This field, in my opinion, is one of the last great American mysteries. Okay, and when we begin to unravel this mystery, we will begin to understand our actual origins the true history of the earth and the multiple reasons that governments all over the world have wanted to suppress this information. Yes. And when you see things like the Phoenix lights, which, which was, were chronicled in remarkably good video. And you hear people like governor Fife Symington talk about his experience seeing them over the period of an hour and you listen to people like Dr. Lynn Dumai, who has remarkable photographs and who witnessed this sort of thing. And you just have to ask yourself, with all these remarkable sightings by all these people and all these encounters and all this abduction talk and, and all the, the <clears throat> many, many thousands of encounters that people have had, why isn't the government speaking up about this? Yep. And why isn't anybody in authority willing to speak about this? Even Bill Clinton, who asked point blank, more or less denied it. Now, the closest any president has come, there's two. There's Jimmy Carter, who did Jimmy. actually see that and and spoke about it. And then there's Barack Obama, who was on Jimmy Kimmel recently. When Jimmy asked him point uh. blank about <laughs> it, he just said, well, I'm not supposed to talk about this. Well, he, you're not jokingly, supposed to talk about it. Yeah. Why? He said it jokingly, but you know he, that you know he, he, he was, it, it was actually <laughs> truth. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, he didn't want to just sit there and lie about it, right, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, anybody who's spent any time, like yourselves, researching this area knows that there's something really serious going on. And the implication of, the, of this go way beyond just the physical sightings or encounters of craft and you know, hardware and debris, it, it goes much deeper than that. And it goes much, much further back back than any, any you know, uh, contemporary academic archaeologist is willing to admit. Mm-hmm. And this is what we need to do. We as educated, intelligent beings need to do is to look into this mystery and say, hey, what is really going on here? What is so dramatic and so heavy that nobody's willing to talk about it. Well, uh, why, why isn't anybody willing to talk about it? Why is the French government the only government who's been willing to release anything at all about this? Well, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question. I'm going to, I'm going to start it out by saying it would be in a perfect world, Paul. <laughs> um, what do you think our current reality would be like in 2016 if back in, I'm just speaking strictly about North America right now, if we had, mo- the white men in the government hadn't come in and slaughtered the Native Americans and other indigenous cultures in North America, what do you think the world would be like today if, A, that never happened, B, we coexisted simultaneously, and C, the government didn't come in and try to cover up everything that they did? In the perfect world, if those elements, we all lived and cohabitated together in peace and harmony, 
with the government staying out of the effing way, what do you think we would know about star beings, ancient aliens today that we don't know in the perfect world? <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, as you know, the Hopi, you know, um, even today talk about their origins as coming from the star beings and their spirituality being deeply connected with their relationship to these stars beings. Yes. And I believe in a, in a perfect world, you know, if we had come over to North America and cohabited peacefully with these Native American cultures, yep. that we would have learned the truth about our relationship with our forebears, if you will. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we had listened to the Native American people, we could have learned to live in harmony with nature and in harmony with one another in a peaceful and spiritual way that was at once empowering to us and to them, and we could have lived and co-created a reality in which everybody was nurtured and fed and honored and allowed us to be in a deeper communion with the natural world in a way that would bring us closer to these non-physical realities that we're talking about. Which takes us right back to the very top of the interview with Paul, which Tony and I really appreciate, and that is experiences like what you and your sister had would have been considered normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it could have been that you had that experience often all the way through your life, all the way up until this very moment. It would have been co-creative in that multidimensional realm as well. Mm. That well would be put. beautiful. Well put. Well, on that note, we are out of time, but we have to say this was so fascinating, and I, I hope, we, I hope, I know you're going to be running around there like a chicken with its yeah, head cut off. Yeah, you're going to be kind of busy, ain't you? <laughs> but it, it would be. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like being inside of a, a uh, an old clock from the 17th century, you know, where there's all these wheels moving around <laughs> yeah. all at the same time, different sizes, different speeds, yeah. and us, Victoria and I, trying to keep track of the movement of that entire time piece. And so while we're there, it's a very busy time, but not too busy for you guys. You know, you can always connect with our our public relations person, Susan, and she'll connect you with us. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Well, Paul, thank you so much. Everybody, if, you, if you're local and you haven't bought your ticket yet, please go to contactinthedesert.com. I know the, the there's a lot of hotels that have sold out, so I know that's you know that's kind of an issue. But you know, but it's, it's just not a that, drive. It's, it's a, a simple dri drive. It's a drive here from LA, just a couple hours. You know, maybe 45 minutes from Palm Springs. But if you can go, go have a great time. Learn something. That's the biggest thing. Learn some, something. I know I will. I know Eddie will. And uh, if you if you're you know because we get people from all over the world that listen in. Hey, there's always next year. Save your money, buy your plane tickets, and uh, next year is going to be your year to attend Contact in the Desert. So, Paul, thank you so much. We appreciate thank you. you. Thank you to both of you. I, I, I deeply appreciate your support, and I've, I thoroughly enjoyed being on the show. Oh, awesome. thank you. Thanks, and Paul. We'll, hopefully, like I said, if, hopefully we'll see you out there. Yep. All right. <laughs> Take care, Paul. All right, you All right. guys. Bye. Take care now. Eddie, yes. I am here. I, I, right before we went on air, I was like, we probably get 30 minutes out of Paul. Mm -hmm. We could have kept going. We could have kept going for days. Yeah. I mean, that was just like f f five or six of the of the speakers, and there's tons of speakers. There's a lot of events, not just speaking uh, speakers that are going to be talking, lecturing to a, the, the audience, but there's a lot of events, little parties going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you guys can come out, come out and, and uh, say hi to Eddie and I. Yeah. We'd love it. All right. Well, if you guys uh, missed this or you uh, want to listen to it again, there's a lot of great information in there that Paul was giving us. I know I'll probably go back and listen to it, but go to a uh, YouTube channel, uh, T uh, Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. Subscribe, leave a comment. We'd love that. And uh, listen to us on iHeartRadio, iTunes. And, uh, you know, next week we won't be here in studio. We're going to be in Joshua Tree. Yeah. And uh, we have a lot. I think June's pretty much booked up. So go to truthbetoldwebtv.com. Find out all our upcoming guests. We have some great damn guests coming up in June. I mean. It so gets better and better. It does. So, But we appreciate you guys. And uh, we will see you next week from Joshua Tree, Contact in the Desert. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye,